Okay, so uh, again, some some background to uh, the countercurrent multiplier. Now, uh, remember we have already discussed ADH in the last lecture. Okay, you you know or you should know uh, uh, how is how it is uh, where it is formed, where is it released from, uh, what are the conditions. One is uh, of course uh, hyperosmolarity, another is uh, changes in blood volume. We've we've done that, and if if uh, this is something that you are are not clear about you you need to pause this video and uh, watch the uh, the water handling one uh, lecture okay and you will understand we have a whole discussion there of adh so i'm not going to go into details uh, i'll just summarize here that high adh is required for concentration of urine because this is uh, how you will create uh, you will uh, allow aquaporins to get inserted in the collecting duct so, uh, the extra these are water channels uh, and and uh, I uh, talk, talked about in the last lecture talked about the reversibility of of this mechanism. This is not fixed uh, as uh, PCT water reabsorption at the PCT is fixed. This, however, is variable. It only comes into play when you need it, i.e., in dehydration. So ADH I won't talk about. Uh, I'll straight jump into HOMI. Now HOMI is hyperosmolar medullary interstitial. This medullary interstitial the area surrounding the loop of Henle and uh, the collecting duct, this needs to be flooded with solute, extra solute so that, as I mentioned, uh, extra water can be reabsorbed. So the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is where uh, most of the action uh, comes in and uh, actively sodium along with uh, potassium and two chloride are pumped from the lumen into uh, the interstitial. Again, this is something that we have discussed when we were discussing sodium transport. We discussed the thick ascending limb of lupo Fenley, if you remember. Uh, and let, let me just jog your memory. Furosemide was an antidiuretic, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, a diuretic, which uh, blocked that symporter. That's sodium, one sodium, one potassium, two chloride symporter, if you remember that now. So that is the, uh, the, the transporter which enhances the uptake of solute from inside the lumen and pumps it into the interstitium. This is the mainstay, one of the mainstays of creation of hyperosmolarity of the interstitium. The num number two is urea. Now this is, this may, may come to you as a surprise that, uh, of course your concept about urea is that it's a waste product and it's given out, uh, it's excreted uh, from the urine. And that is indeed the case. However, today you will learn that urea is very ingeniously used to add to this uh, medullary interstitial. Uh, in fact, it's 50% of the HOMI. So sodium is 50% and the other 50% is urea. And you uh, will be uh, interested to know that during a uh, normal situation, urea does not get concentrated in the, in the medullary interstitial. Uh, it's only when ADH is present as it is the case with dehydration, is when uh, urea can cross from the uh, exiting urine in the medullary interstitial, uh, in, the, in the collecting medullary collecting duct and enter into the interstitial and add to the HOMI. More on this in the urea cycle <clears throat> later on in this discussion. For now, what is, what is enough is sodium and urea approximately account for the 50% each of HOMI that you need to create. Okay. Now this uh, scary looking diagram is not very scary if you uh, understand the basics of it. So before I, I go into it, please remember <clears throat> a couple of things. And those couple of things is uh, the way this diagram is made. Uh, firstly, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll go slow here. These figures, these numbers are osmolarity of the tubular fluid. So if it's inside the tube, it's tubular fluid osmolarity. If it's outside, it is the uh, interstitium. It is the interstitium, uh, osmolarity of the interstitium. As you go along, dip into the inner, inner segment of the interstitium, this is where the medulla is. And as you go away from the medulla, this is where the cortex is. Okay, so obviously the loop, of the the nephron is arranged in such a way that the long tubule uh, 
uh, from PCT, uh, which lies in the cortex, then dips to the in uh, into deeper into the medulla, the outer medulla, and then in the inner deeper medulla. These are the uh, uh, the long loop of Henle nephrons uh, that are uh, involved in concentration of urine. Okay, so they really loop into the inner inner inner, inner medulla uh, and form those hairpin structures. Right. Uh, so I have mentioned this that these values represent osmolarity inside uh, the uh, tubular uh, uh, the tubule or uh, in the surrounding interstitium. The HOMR that you need to create is in the interstitium here, here. Okay, this the loop of Henle not shown here, but uh, the, this loop of Henle is obviously go uh, uh, up, make the DCT, and then here it will become the collecting duct. So the collecting duct here and the loop of Henle, the, the, the pin, the hair pin, they lie in the same neighborhood, the neighborhood of the interstitium. It's this interstitium that needs to be flooded with solute. It's this uh, where you need the HOMI. Okay, uh, that's one thing. Uh, then the second thing to know about this diagram, how it's made, is that when you see these arrows, Okay, this arrow here and this swinging arrow this uh, arrow here and then this arrow here uh, remember that this means that you have fresh fluid coming from PCT into your loop of Henle just 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 stay with this program here so th this is what this means when you have this scenario where you see that the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and uh, at the level you have st uh, these uh, strong arrows these dark arrows i uh, remember that this is part of the single effect uh, i'll explain it to you in a bit just remember what i'm saying this is the single effect uh, followed by the dashed arrow in the cons uh, in the subsequent slide so you see now a pattern in these slides you have uh, a, 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 a a picture a, a stage rather a phase where you see these arrows where fresh fluid is coming in. Then you see a combination of two pictures here, right here. So you brought in fresh fluid. Then a single effect happened, which is depicted in these two pictures. Okay. Then the single effect happened. Then again, you have a repetition. You have fresh fluid coming in. Then again, the single effect is happening. Okay. And then this step is repeated many times uh, such that the osmolarities really start to be, look very angry. Now, you, if you compare this with, say, this, certainly this, uh, this is uh, a serious uh, number, 1,200 milliosmol. It's, it's a very high osmolarity. In fact, this is the upper limit of HOMI. HOMI is can be concentrated up to 1200 milliosmoles and uh, and uh, consequently concentration of urine can be raised osmolarity of urine can be raised up to 1200 as well not above that so here you pick up the concept of uh, HOMI dictating the osmolarity of the, uh, of the urine uh, the maximum that you can create uh, concentrate uh, the urine is 1200 milliosmol and that the reason for that is that uh, the, that is the maximum capability of uh, HOMI in the interstitium. More of this will make sense to you as we go along. Now let's go into the nitty gritty of it. Now that if you have understood what I've set up. Uh, so say this is when everything was at peace and uh, honky dory nothing was happening no excitement but as soon as this uh, now goes into this this is where the dehydration has happened plasma osmolarity has gone up now you need to uh, adh has gone up now you need to uh, create homi and so the single effect will come into play if you remember i've been mentioning single effect earlier as well this is that very very interesting ability of the tubule to separate solute from water uh, and again i will repeat 
that sodium is a is an osmol which basically means that it likes it does not like to travel alone it will always try want to take water with it that that's the case and if you want to only reabsorb solute and not let water follow that is called the single effect that usually cannot happen in any other part or any other tissue except the renal tubule okay and except in the renal tubule only in the thick ascending limb of loop of henle uh, which is also called the diluting segment is where this uh, effect mainly can be seen so check this out now the 300 there was 300 everywhere right 300 was in the uh, uh, the fresh fluid that was coming in from the PCT. Uh, 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 again, the thin descending limb, the thin ascending limb, and the thick ascending limb. Anatomically, this is not correct. Of course, the, these these are supposed to be thin, and then this area is supposed to be thick, but stay with it. It's a simple diagram. I think it's from Guyton, so it will help you. That's why I selected it. So every every everything is 300. Now, when you turn the charm on, when you turn the, the single effect on, what happens what happens is this is 300 when it came here so it encountered that symporter the sodium potassium two chloride symporter right yes what did it do it pulled the solute from in the lumen and pumped it into the interstitium yes but did not allow water to follow because the water is permeable these these is this epithelium here is impermeable to water transport. The water stays back. What is the result of this one simple effect? That you raised a tad the, 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 concentr the osmolarity of the interstitium. And, you, and in comparison, you diluted the osmolarity of the tubular fluid. Because remember, you removed the solute but did not let water follow. So you did two insults to the tubular fluid here in the thick ascending limb of Rupa Fenle. You, you snatched the, uh, the solute away from it, but kept the water there and uh, did not allow the water to follow. So naturally, what left what is left behind is diluter as compared to what came in. Okay, what came in was 300, but what ended up here is basically uh, because of this action is now diluter so uh, this interstitium uh, will be will get a bit rich uh, than what it was before because it has now received uh, a, a paycheck of solute okay and and hence it has become 400 while the osmolarity of the of this fluid has become 200 okay uh, if you have understood this, that's great. That's a, 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 the initial uh, phase of the single effect. Now, you have created a slight increase in osmolarity in the interstitium. Yes. And since it's a hairpin structure, it's a hairpin structure. Hairpin structures are important in thermoregulation and in, in this scenario, what you're uh, reading now the concentration of urine in the sense that if this were a straight tube uh, you would have very different situation uh, simply you could not could never have concentrated urine more of this uh, uh, later when we'll talk about the maintenance of HOMI uh, but uh, it's it's very obvious to see that if you do something to the fluid here which has a bearing on the interstitium here this interstitium is the neighborhood. This is where the descending thin limb also lives. So the fluid, which now is moving inside the thin descending limb, is sort is exposed to uh, the same interstitium, the same neighborhood that you created by doing this action. So what happens? What happens is this fluid, which was in the thin ascending, thin descending limb, it and it's water permeable. We've, we've spoken about it. It will give out its water. Why will it give out it? Simple osmosis. It will give out its water because uh, the interstitium outside is more osmolar as compared to this. It was not the case here, but because of this first phase of single effect, you added solute here, 
this added solute will cause an osmotic drag of, uh, on the water inside the thin descending limb and the water will come out. These dashed lines is movement of water. The strong lines are movement of solute. So now you understand. This water will come out of the interstitium, raising the osmolarity out inside the in, in, a fluid that is left behind in the tubule. This is very obvious. That extra water will be picked up by the vasorector and taken away. So this 400 will be preserved, right? This is the single effect. These are the two phases of the single effect. What is the first phase? Again, I'm revising now, is the pickup of solute from the tubule and dumping it into the interstitial by the thick ascending limb of Rupofenlia. This creation of the extra osmolarity in the interstitial then has an effect on the thin descending limb of Rupofenlia where water is pulled out, raising the osmolarity of this fluid now uh, and the extra water is taken away so that this is not disturbed. Okay, now you have done one cycle. This is one cycle. This three, these three diagrams are one cycle. The first, then the single effect, and then that's that. Now you just need to repeat, keep on repeating this cycle. But the difference is that you have changed things. You have changed the osmolarity of the incoming tubular fluid. Uh, you have changed the osmolarity of the interstitium and the solute single effect will will take place anyway but now it will take place on this uh, changed fluid that you have created so now this 400 will will be pushed forward because new fluid of 300 from pre city has been pumped in this has been pumped in this will push the 400 os uh, os uh, osmolarity carrying fluid forwards it will now come to the thick ascending side of things and will be acted upon uh, by the single effect. Now you can see that that 400 here, okay, will again, uh, you will have the single effect, the symporter will pull the solute and dump it into the uh, uh, this uh, interstitium. And now you see that that 400 became 300, while the 400 in the, street, in the, in the interstitium became 500, okay. Uh, before I go, uh, move on to this uh, and finish this subject uh, you will uh, see a mathematical uh, symmetry in these diagrams whenever the single effect would take place remember this remember the factor of 200 this is a this is a cheat uh, to understand or and remember this these figures you don't have to cram them whenever the single effect will take place there will always be a difference of 200 between this fluid and this fluid always so you see 400 and 200 is the difference is 200 okay now when you brought in 400 here oops when you brought in 400 here again the single effect happened made this 500 the rest was 300 what is the difference 200 yes and as it goes up above this is the maximum uh, osmolarity uh, uh, at any given time but as as i mentioned as you go towards the cortex the osmolarity drops so as you go up this 500 actually is 350 but again the difference is always 200 so this is an important thing to remember okay now just to complete the cycle once again to, so that the concept is solidified uh, this 500 here will then attract water out of the descending thin limb Okay, water will come out as is shown here, leaving behind uh, increase even more increase osmolarity. From 400, it has now become to 500. That extra volume is now uh, the extra water is taken away from the vasa uh, by the vasorector, so that this is preserved. You keep on repeating the single effect. You keep on bringing fresh fluid, which I'll say it in the reverse direction uh, now. You bring on uh, bringing the fresh fluid, uh, fresh fluid of 300 into the thin descending limb of Rupofenle, it will come across increasing gradient of osmolarity in the interstitium as it moves along the thin descending limb, giving away its water, becoming concentrated itself. And by the time it hits the thick, 
thin ascending and especially the thick ascending lipopropofenolate, it will it will uh, naturally uh, give up its salute uh, from the tubule to the interstitium, raising the interstitial fluid osmolarity even more. And this cycle sort of goes on and on and on till it becomes this. Okay, this. So at the tip of the loop, you can have a situation where uh, the, the, uh, the osmolarity has risen to 1200, which will obviously induce uh, a 1200 uh, osmolarity change in the fluid that is coming in the system and going up and out. Okay. Now, uh, some concluding remarks about this. Uh, you see, you have understood this uh, single effect, I hope. And and eventually, uh, let's let's talk about what is happening here. So, in this in this area, you have hyperosmolarity in the interstitium and inside the tubule. But as you move up because you are taking out a lot of solute from here, you are diluting the segment, you are making water uh, uh, abundant inside the tubule and taking solute out, using the solute to attract more water out of the thin descending limb. This is the story up till now, yes? Uh, and you have understood the trick here. The trick here is to use the solute to bring out water out of the thin uh, descending limb, okay? So uh, uh, this is one source of that extra water that I was talking about. But the main uh, situation, the main thing will come uh, when you put, uh, consider that this DCT will then become the collecting duct. Okay. And it's this collecting duct here, which I'll show you in a bit, is where the ADH has already made inroads for that extra water to come in once it's available. Remember? ADH has inserted those aquaporins. Okay, so the stage is set. This interstitium, this here, is also available here. It's in the entire neighborhood. The whole neighborhood has become hyperosmolar. So, collecting duct, uh, this fluid of uh, uh, this diluted fluid, heavy in water, which you have created very cleverly. Now, when it comes in the collecting duct, it has absolutely no choice but to give away most of its water to the hyperosmolar osmolarity through the newly made aquaporin uh, motorways uh, under the able leadership of ADH and uh, that water, uh, that precious water is now uh, given away, taken away by the vasodictor, uh, which improves the, uh, eventually addresses the osmolarity of the hyperosmolar plasma, okay? This is the countercurrent multiplier. And this is the overall slide. Uh, you see that it's working. This is this is the single effect mediated hyperosmolarity. The picture now is complete. You have this collecting duct here, okay? And this is the this is the membrane which is ADH sensitive, okay? This is where the ADH expresses uh, those aquaporins. And you see that uh, the fluid that came towards uh, this area was uh, was dilute this is where look at this 100 and in fact uh, this is uh, this becomes about 300 uh, ish as soon as it's starting to hit uh, come back into the hyper osmolar uh, environment because it is now made uh, made to give out its water uh, a bit of salt as well and we'll talk about the urea in a bit so when you remove water from the from the fluid uh, uh, in the tubular fluid, what remains behind is concentrated urine because you have taken away this water. Uh, the whole point was to reabsorb extra water. So uh, once again, uh, from cortex to medulla, you have created a hyper osmolar environment uh, so that you don't let uh, that extra water that uh, in in the in, in the tubular fluid that would have gone out and uh, in, in any case, you don't let that go out, that this hyperosmolarity drags that water in. Uh, you can see the uh, role of ADH uh, providing those aquaporins and all of that. So this is the HOMI and the increased ADH, which basically saves the day in a plasma hyperosmolar situation, okay? Uh, this is, uh, these are the main points. Uh, now the urea cycle, very briefly, uh, 
it's it's it may look like a cluttered slide, but it's simple really. Urea is a waste product. It's cleared from the plasma. It, uh, as you can see here, strong arrow. Uh, it's it's put out in the in the in the PCT, and it just uh, flows around uh, uh, throughout the tubule. What is peculiar now is the following. You see that this this uh, th this line here, this epithelium here, is has has been shown very strong in dark color. This is where this is where urea cannot go out. It it it's trapped inside the uh, renal tubule. This is something which uh, uh, raises the concentration of urea because uh, all sorts of things are happening in the in the in the in the fluid uh, inside, but urea cannot do anything. Urea has to stay in. And hence it gets concentrated. Okay. Uh, by the time the, the this fluid hits the ADH sensitive areas, remember ADH. And now you 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 will recall that when you read that uh, info slide of ADH uh, in the last lecture that, that we discussed, uh, you saw that ADH not only uh, reabsorbs water, it also enhances urea uptake. Okay. So ADH actually in this area where it's most uh, uh, most active, uh, not only uh, inserts aquaporins, but it also uh, facilitates, stimulates the uh, the insertion of UT1 receptors, urea transporter, UT1, urea transporter one receptors here, so that urea can can leak out into the interstitium. Why would we want urea to leak out? in this particular scenario in the interstitium because we are creating HOMI, okay? Uh, we have spoken about the HOMI of sodium. Now we are talking about that other 50%, the urea. So check this out. The urea will exit from the collecting duct, the inner medullary uh, collecting duct into the interstitium, adding to the hyperosmolarity, okay? But then it does something which sodium doesn't do, it's that it's secreted, and this is important. It is secreted into the, <clears throat> into the loop of Henry. So uh, here you literally trap urea. Whatever urea is coming from this uh, tubular fluid, you uh, you take it out uh, inside, keep it inside uh, the interstitium, and then. When it goes into it, when it goes up uh, to a significant concentration, you start to secrete it inside the lumen. Back, it goes does the uh, the whole journey back again, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, you excrete less urea in concentration of urine scenario, the dehydration scenario, than you would have done normally when water was available because now you're using urea ingeniously to add to your HOMI and you're trapping it in a circular fashion. Okay, I hope you understood this. You are secreting it, then it goes up and comes down. You reabsorb it from here and then again, use it to attract water and all that stuff, secrete it back and keep on using it till you've had your fill, you have reabsorbed uh, enough water and the plasma osmolarity has gone up again. So this is that 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 urea cycle that I was talking about the 50% of the HOMI. Uh, footnote here is that urea is a metabolic waste product. Guess which metabolism uh, does it come out of? Protein, right? It's it's a protein uh, 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 metabolic waste product. So people, interesting fact, people who are vegans are pure vegetarians. Uh, would they have the same amount of urea that a non-veg would? Of course not, because they don't eat animal protein. The, all, all, all the protein that they get is from vegetable sources. Okay, So the urea in these people is less. Urea, urea, urea production is less. Hence, the urea cycle, availability of urea for the urea cycle is less. So yes, now you know where I'm going. The ability of these people to concentrate th their urine in dehydration is less because HOMI is dependent on sodium and urea in a concentration uh, in dehydration scenario. So pure vegans will have uh, trouble concentrating their urine 
because of this fact. So this is an interesting fact to note. Now, before we go to the, the, the last part, uh, let's, let me recap what we have discussed. Till now, we discussed dilution of urine, where water is abundant, no rocket science there. You just remove the solute at the thick ascending limb of Lugofenle and you let water go out. And there is no idiot, so nothing, nothing spectacular is going to happen. Now you understand that that part of the of the of the situation was simpler, right? You appreciate that now. Uh, the story becomes uh, interesting when you want to when you are go, when you go into dehydration, right? When you go into dehydration, you need to concentrate urine. It's that it's there that you that you need some some extra um, situation, extra mechanisms and that extra mechanism is countercurrent mechanism uh, uh, by creating uh, HOMI which then provides the extra uh, uh, pump extra attraction for extra water to be reabsorbed this HOMI is created collectively by sodium and urea uh, we discuss countercurrent mechanism and the single effect and all that this is the urea cycle now the HOMI that is created in the in, in the in the in, in the interstitium uh, is the same place as i mentioned earlier where water reabsorbed water is also coming through so you may have a situation you will have a situation where this water will dilute this interstitium okay and the whole story goes down the drain so no that does not happen is because along this tubule you have the renal tubular network which also goes side by side along these long uh, 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 limbs of lo long loops of uh, loop of Henle. Okay, it run, runs along them and forms a countercurrent exchange mechanism, which conserves the HOMI for as long as you want. Okay, these are the this is the thing. This is now what we are discussing. Uh, the first thing was HOMI creation. Now we are talking about maintenance of the HOMI. Remember that uh, creation of the HOMI, the mechanism is called countercurrent multiplication. You multiply solute inside the interstitium, and by that you attract water. Okay, I, I, there's a reason I I'll, I'll tell you why I'm emphasizing this. This is countercurrent exchanger. Countercurrent exchanger is the vasorector. And that is to do with maintenance of the HOMI. Now, why the emphasis is sometimes uh, a very unfortunate thing happens when you are asked uh, about countercurrent exchanger in an SCQ and in your exams, and you, in your hurry, uh, write down countercurrent multiplication. You can imagine uh, what kind of marks would you get. Uh, the examiner asked you the exchanger, and uh, you, in your hurry. Uh, did not understand that and you wrote down the completely like a completely different mechanism so uh, again there is no cramming here if you remember countercurrent multiplication means all that single effect uh, 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 pump, uh, trapping all that solute multiplying it with each cycle that is the countercurrent multiplier however the vasorector is the countercurrent exchanger and we, we will see why are we using the word exchanger okay so word of caution be careful read the question carefully okay now there are two mechanisms by which vasa rector saves the day there are two mechanisms how vasa rector basically maintains helps the homi do its job one is it is just like uh, the loop of henle it is a looped structure it's not a straight line it's not a straight tube it is in loop okay the only difference is the flow of blood is opposite then flow of uh, tubular fluid okay now one is the hair loop structure of the vasorector so uh, what is coming down is being affected by what is going up and both of the coming down and the going up both bloods are being affected by the neighborhood the interstitial just like the loop of henle just like the loop of henle what you did at the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle had a bearing on the thin descending limb of loop of Henle. Yes. So the descending limb 
the blood in the descending limb of the vasorector uh, will be influenced by what is happening in the interstitium and when it Trans, uh, does a transaction with that interstitium, whatever change happens has an effect on the ascending limb of Lupo I'll, I'll tell you what, what's going on. Okay. Uh, second point is the sluggish flow. If, I don't know if you remember, uh, we mentioned this right at the beginning of the renal uh, lectures when we were discussing uh, the functional anatomy of the renal tubule, uh, the whole thing, the nephron. And I mentioned that as you go deeper into the medulla, uh, the overall flow of blood decreases, right? If you remember that, it's the it's the least in the inner medulla. That now has come to the fore. This is the sluggish blood flow through the vasorector is important. You don't want uh, a high velocity blood to go through uh, this whole system because remember that high velocity fluids have a washing away quote unquote washing away effect if you increase velocity of this fluid it will tend to wash away the fluid because the solute will not have uh, time to be reabsorbed back in the ascending limb we will talk about this so just remember that the fluid the blood flow through this uh, vasorector the deeper the deepest portions of the medullary interstitium is slow this also helps in keeping the HOMI intact. Okay. Now, let's see uh, the hair loop structure. Uh, if it were not a hair loop, what would have happened? Well, disaster. What is what would have happened? Okay. You would have put in a fluid. Okay. Imagine that this is the neighborhood. This is the same. You have the interstitium with increasing osmolarity that we have discussed just now being created by the HOMI, right? And instead of the loop, the hair loop, you have a straight blood vessel going through and through, right? Okay. This is an interesting, ex good exercise. Uh, not explained in Guyton uh, as such, okay? The comparison is, comparison is not there. Guyton only discusses the hair loop. I discussed this, this uh, lack of hair loop as well, just to show you how important the hair loop structure is, okay? Now in the straight tube, when you when you introduce a fluid with with 300 milli osmol, uh, osmolarity, it won't have significant problems right in the beginning because it's 300 outside it's 300. Everybody's happy, okay? But as it goes down, as it goes deeper, it then comes across increasing osmolarity, the HOMI. The more deeper it goes, the more uh, concentrated uh, environment it goes into. What starts to happen? The blue arrows depict the water. It starts to give out its water and it starts to pick solute, right? So it just goes down, literally goes down the drain, giving out its water, picking up solute. By the end of this straight tube, what started with uh, a value of 300 it has now become 750, okay? And, and uh, 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 what started with uh, 300, and should have been 600, 900, and 1200 is now basically 1000. So one circulation of blood through this straight tube raised the osmolarity from of blood from 300 to 750, obviously because it gave out its water and picked up a lot of solute. And where did it pick the solute from? From the precious HOMI scenario, uh, atmosphere. Decreasing the HOMI uh, concentration of solute or its osmolarity, uh, the whole point was to maintain it uh, and hence the match is lost okay now let's see the beauty of all you need to do is is just uh, 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 put a loop in this long tube make a loop not a straight line just make a loop like this like this so this tube is here it's the descending limb it loops and then becomes the same tube becomes the ascending limb and exits Okay. This has very important implications. Uh, so the same discussion is when the, uh, the blood is coming back into the system, it's 300, say, for example, just to explain it to you. 300, when it comes down, it encounters an increasing HOMI, 600, 900, and maybe 1200 if we are working at the top 
speed, a top uh, concentration. That, that the counter current multiplier is really churning out, churning away. So as this 300 goes down the descending limb, it will pick up solute, give out its water, right? That it did here as well, okay? So by the time it hits the tip of the loop of the pin here, hair pin, it becomes one with the interstitial. The, the osmolarity is 1200, the osmolarity is 1200, okay? It reflects the same. However, it's not a straight tube. It will now pin back on its own. And <clears throat> uh, remember, this distance is uh, uh, shown, this is not the, uh, the case. They are, the, the descending and ascending limbs are, uh, they lie very close to each other, okay? So, what now happens is you are parading this blood that you brought in and all sorts of things happen to it. You're parading this blood back out uh, of the ascending limb uh, from the same neighborhood, but in a reverse direction. And this reverse direction makes all the difference. How? Now this hyper or osmolar blood, when it goes through the ascending limb, it now goes through those that, that hyper osmolar interstitium in the reverse direction. So as it rises through the ascending limb, it comes across uh, a decreasing gradient of osmolarity. Yes, it's clear. So what will it do? It will pick up water. It will give out its solute. There you have it. As it ascends, it keeps on doing it, picking up that water, giving out that solute till it exits. So what happens in the net? The net is you take out water, out, and very less solute. This is the net. There are important implications, important summaries coming up, uh, uh, but, but I'll pause here uh, so that you, you understand what has just happened. The hairpin structure, basically what it did is, it conserved the solute of the interstitium uh, and uh, took away the water, its own water, and also the water that came out of the lupofenolate and the collecting duct. Capish, you happy with that? I hope you've understood it. Again, these are not replacements for your own reading. That reading is very important. Those discussions over cups of teas or coffee or whatever you have uh, with your colleagues is very important. These things, physiology uh, it nourishes, uh, flourishes, develops. Uh, based on discussions, okay? So having said the bare bone thing, now I'll come to the imp important conclusions. Uh, the obvious thing have we have we've done that the water that would have messed the HOMI is picked up by the vasorector and taken away. That's, the, that's one thing. There's a salt implication as well, an implication, a, a, a complication related to salt. Remember NSCL, it crystallizes, right? Uh, it would, if you allow it to stay in one place, it will tend to form crystals. Yes. So in counter current multiplication, you are dealing with a lot of sodium chloride and you're dumping it in a, in an area uh, where there is interstitium. Interstitium is not known for a, for its uh, traffic. Is it? What is known for its traffic? Tubular, tub, the tubule, there are lots of fluid is passing through it. The vasa recta, it's a blood vessel. A lot of blood is passing through it. But what happens in the interstitium? Interstitium is just a space, right? And you're dumping so much uh, solute in there, uh, you always run a, a risk of uh, uh, making crystals there. So vasa recta, another function of vasa recta is keeping it real, keeping it fluid, literally. Uh, the, the salt should remain a salt in granular form, not make crystals because that will create a lot of issues, as you can imagine. So the moving vasa recta keeps stirring the, uh, the interstitium, uh, pushing in water, uh, stirring it a bit, picking it up and so on and so forth. So it keeps on stirring it like you stir your tea with a spoon. Yes. Uh, so that crystal formation is inhibited. Another thing is if you notice the 300 and the 350, if you noticed, so this osmolarity of the leaving fluid is a tad more than what came in, right? So any extra salt is also taken up by 
the buzzer vector any extra salt okay so you need just enough salt to create the homi do the benefit the business of extra water reabsorption but at the same time not form crystals okay so homi does both it has got the stirring effect and then it picks off your extra top up of salt so that you don't have any uh, uh, unforced uh, un untoward issue in your interstitial okay and the sluggish flow we discussed it needs to be sluggish so that it that doesn't run off with a lot of salute that's that